Hello and welcome to the MIT 2016 Open House Distinguished Lecture Series. My name is Philip Twarowski, and I'm currently a junior in courses 16 and 18, which are aerospace engineering and math here at MIT. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you Professor Robert Merton. Um, Dr. Merton is the School of Management Distinguished Professor um, at the Sloan uh, School of Management. Uh, here at MIT, as well as a university professor emeritus at Harvard University. Um, he received his PhD from MIT in economics in 1970, and his research includes finance, finance theory, life cycle and retirement finance, the dynamics of institutional change, and improving the methods of measuring and managing ma macrofinancial risk. In 1997, um, Dr. Merton received his uh, Alfred Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences for his work on new methods to determine the value of derivatives. Please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Merton to begin. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming out on, whoops. I didn't know whether I should wish for a rainy day or a sunny day. It's been so beautiful yesterday. I think if we had that, the room would be completely empty. But in any case, thank you for coming. Uh, for my topic today, I was uh, going, as you can see, talk about the role of innovation. And of course, we are at MIT and the university or institute, so we should talk about the role of science in all of this. And it's all, in the end, relevant to the issues of the impact on global economic and development. So by the way, I should say about my slides, I'm not a slide person. And they're they're going to be very entertaining slides. And in fact, some of them are so c crammed you're going to be hard to read them. If I was up there with you, forget it. But I'm not going to rely on them very much. I'll move them along, just to kind of do it. But the way you should think of these slides, if you find anything you hear this afternoon interesting, you can get copies. Then you're going to be happy that they're compact, because they're not so heavy to carry around. So don't get frustrated if you say, I can't even read this, let alone comprehend it. So I'm, I'm just going to use But this is kind of my agenda for the day. And I'm going to start by just talking about something that is often forgotten. Uh, you know, that to have a, uh, a well-functioning financial system is absolutely essential to growth and economic development everywhere. Uh, this, uh, sometimes there's this notion that there's the real sector, Main Street out there, and then there's the other thing called Wall Street, which is the finance sector. I have to tell you, the, I'm on the Chinese Academy of Sciences some committee that involves finance. So you can imagine when I looked at the English translation of the committee I was on, I was on the committee on the fictitious economy. <laughs> I said, how did that happen? I think, I don't know, but I have a good suspicion. If the real economy is Wall Street, Main Street, then I guess finance is on real. And you can imagine going from on real, the translation to the Mandarin back to English, and what's the synonym for on real? Fictitious. OK, so that's my theory anyway as to how I got that title. But other than some textbooks in macroeconomics that are probably a little aged, the idea that you have dichotomy, that you have the real sector and the financial sector, uh, is a fiction. And I hope to illustrate that to today by going through actual examples and so forth rather than uh, giving you a lecture on it. And in particular, I can give you some intuition uh, based on some research that was done, among others, by uh, my uh, professor at one time and colleague and uh, good friend uh, Robert Solo, who won the Nobel Prize in 1987 for his theory on growth. And his, he made many contributions, but basically one of the most important, the one best known perhaps, is that when he examined economic growth and its determinants, he found, at least for the 19th and 20th century, that it wasn't population growth, having lots of children, nor was it frugality, high savings rates. Now, you save more, you must invest more, therefore, uh, you, you must grow more. Uh, in fact, it was technological progress. And he both had the theory, and then he, you know, the data seemed to support or be, in, be consistent with that theory. And that was kind of a revolutionary way of thinking of things compared to the way people thought in the past. So technology. Now, if you think about it, we could have all this fantastic technology, which we do, here at MIT in the labs and so forth. Wonderful ideas in every area. But unless that technology can be translated into implementation in the broad economy deeply, 
it will never manifest itself into growth. You actually have to do it. You can't just invent it and find it. You have to implement it. You have to make it permeate its uses throughout the economy. And the process of doing that is essential for that is to have a well-functioning financial and legal system that allows you to raise the resources, manage the risk, and do so efficiently and effectively to get the implementation done. So I just a fast pass through. This is not the purpose of the lecture. Just to say whatever you've heard in the, even places like the New York Times, editorial anyway, um, or the Wall Street Journal or wherever, many things you may have heard about finance in the last 10 years, a number of them are true, uh, are accurate, I think. But what isn't accurate is the idea that this isn't very important or it doesn't matter or at very least just contain it from doing anything bad. And that's good enough. That isn't good enough, as I hope you'll see. So what I thought I would do today in, in taking you through this is to say, well, if a financial system, oh, I mentioned Douglas North, another Nobel Prize winner who sadly passed away about a month ago, but at 90-something, so that's not so terrible. Um, that, that's what someone at my age can say. When I get to be 90, if I'm so fortunate, maybe I won't quite look at it like that. But in any case, if you think the financial system is important, how do you improve it? You improve it by a thing called financial innovation. That's the process of approving the financial system. And a variety of things drive that. And in particular, the drivers are finance science, same as in any of the other fields. And it is indeed in science. It has a set of principles, relationships, theories, and hypotheses. And it has rather good data and uses very sophisticated statistical techniques in an organized fashion. Uh, actually able to predict things. And more importantly, some of the things that you work out from it actually work. So we have finance science as a driver. We have, of course, technology, computers, and you know, all of that sort of thing that makes possible to do things that weren't even feasible five years ago, let alone 25 years ago. And so that was critical. And finally, you have something that's very important, getting it implemented, need. You've probably all heard the old saw about real estate valuation. What are the three most important things for valuation? Location, location, location. In getting innovation implemented, not creating the ideas, finding solutions, but actually getting them implemented. The three most important ones, at least in my mind, in my experience over a lot of neck decades of trying to do it and occasionally succeeding, is need, need, and need. OK? So those are the drivers for the process. So I wanted to start off, I'm going to give you sort of a, a quick historical view, not to give you the history history. Because if I was going to give you the history, for example, of finance science, I'd at least have to go back to 1900. And Louis Bachelier, oh, I have to put something out here for anyone who's in finance. You, a lot of the technical stuff in finance, you see the physicists and so forth say, yeah, well, you're mathematical physicists. They all say, well, this is very good. You're just using, uh, you know, but you're, this, the mathematics you use is just physics, mathematics. And I, I have to correct that. You know, MIT always has to try to keep it accurate. There's a, it's almost true, but there's a slight variation. Actually, Louis Bachelier at the Sorbonne in 1900 in his thesis, there's any PhD students in here, there is his thesis, not bad. He developed the mathematical theory of continuous time stochastic processes. And as was required at the time, his application of his mathematics was to option pricing. Options are a thing called derivatives. That was in 1900. And his mathematical derivation, according to people who I respect, when compared to Einstein's you know, 1905 famous Brownian motion paper, Five years later, I'll underscore, Bachelier's was just as rigorous, at least, as Einstein. So actually, if you think it was Einstein's that's being used in finance, actually it was a finance problem, option pricing, that preempted it five years earlier. OK, enough on that sort of thing, but I couldn't resist this audience uh, telling them that. So what I want to do is take you through a bit of history. And I'm going to go back to a period, as you're all aware, probably very painfully so, 2008, 2009, the great financial crisis, which we're still hearing about and feeling the reverberations of, uh, has often been compared back to the Great Depression. And except I, I, I take at least some question, I don't say issue with that, because while well, there are some, you know, it happens probably that it, as measured by the MBER up the street in Central Square, the recession, the Great Recession lasted longer than any other since the Great Depression. 
the difference of the two is pretty substantial. You would have known the difference between the 1930s and 2008. And more to the point, I, for our purposes, I want to take us back to a more recent period, perhaps more relevant, the 1970s, which I'm sure for most of you seems like a long time ago. But compared to the 1930s, it's not. And in particular, in the 1970s, we had many of the same institutions we have today, not as sophisticated necessarily, but we had safety nets and all kinds of things. And I want to show you, uh, through a, uh, going through a very quick pass, uh, <laughs> some of the things that happened in the 1970s in the United States and Western economies that were pretty big, too. And I'm not going to be like some of maybe or some of your parents or grandparents who said to you, when I went to school, I walked uphill both ways in the snow barefoot. You have it easy today. So I'm not going to get into a process of trying to argue whether the 1970s was a tougher time than in the 2008s and so forth. I'll let you make your own judgment from just what I point out to you. But it happened the 1970s was a period in which there was an explosion of risks, big risks, that hit the financial system and the economy uh, pretty much, I don't say simultaneously, but close to simultaneously. I'm just giving you a laundry list in no particular order. The first thing that happened is the fall of Bretton Woods. That was an arrangement by which all the currency, major currencies of the world were linked in price. So you didn't have to look at what currencies were. They were always the same. So basically, nobody ever knew what the currency's exchange rates were because it was pretty boring. And that was established at the end of World War II, about 1944. So for about 30 years, a generation, nobody thought about that. All of a sudden, that whole came apart. And suddenly, all the currencies of the world started moving around with a missing generation of even experience with it, let alone anything else. OK, that's the first one. The second one was the uh, first oil crisis. We didn't know we had the number of them. <laughs> but it turns out that uh, we did. That was where, uh, as, you, as you may have read about it if you weren't there, uh, you had long gasoline lines. And the price of uh, oil went from 250 a barrel to 14. Um, and that was a pretty big shock to the system and which had impacts on all kinds of things. And we had a second one before the end of the decade, and of course we've been in and out of it ever since. Uh, so that's a pretty big one. What else did we have? Double digit inflation, more than 10% inflation. We had not seen that in the United States since the 19th century. 100 years, no experience. Now, it's hard for probably for you to me, especially when you're hearing about Europe worrying about deflation, whether they can get enough inflation. But we had more than double-digit inflation. And the impact of that, particularly on some of the MIT retiree professors and staff, you know, you get 100 a year as your retirement when your first year. Next, what do you get? 90. Then you get 81. And in three years, you're, you've lost 28%, almost 30% of your retirement. That's pretty exciting, OK? in the Chinese sense of the word. And so we had double-digit inflation. At the same time, we had very high unemployment, 9%. Now, if you think of the, the processes, you don't have to be an economist. You certainly, if you've read or listened, what did the central banks of the world try to do? Mr. Bernanke and now uh, Janet Yelton and Mario Draghi, another MIT uh, uh, graduate who runs the ECB, a graduate. Um, what policies they take? They really pump money in there, driving interest rates down, pumping lots of money in to try to keep the economy going. I don't think they could have done that or would have done that if they simultaneously had a 10% inflation rate. So I want you to understand that the 70s was a strange period in which you had very high inflation and very high unemployment, which is not supposed to happen, of course, according to the tradition. It was called stagflation. And it was Mother Nature's way of Bring, get, you know, telling us we had the sin of hubris to think we had solved all these problems. Because what wasn't supposed to happen did. Anyway, so we had that going on. The stock market fell by 50% in the United States in real terms in an 18-month period. Uh, and there was no mortgage money. Why? We had a regulation, too, that said deposits in banks could pay no more than 5%. No more. U.S. Treasury's full faith in credit, short term and long, were, were over 10%. It doesn't take a deep mind to think of, why would I put my money in a bank at 5% when full faith in credit from the U.S. government pays me over 10? So guess what? There was no money for mortgage. It had nothing to do with your credit. You could be whoever you wanted. You couldn't get money. All right? So I, you know, I don't want to go through all of this, but do you get a sense of the flow here? There was a lot of shocks hit the system in pretty major ways. 
okay? And, uh, you know, we had a fairly long recession. Now, what I wanted to take you through this was not for, hey, don't feel so badly about what you've been through. That's not the point. But rather to say, what was one of the impacts of this? One of the impacts of this was an extraordinary amount of financial innovation implemented, all in the 1970s into the 80s and beyond. But it all started there, and it's hard to believe that it wasn't caused in part by the shocks of all these risks coming in. And we're not a fixed system. We're a reacting system. So when something bad happens or something disturbs us, we react. There's feedback. And one of the reactions is to, we got all these shocks of risk. We may not be able to stop them any more than we can stop hurricanes. But we can try to devise means by which we can measure and manage those risks. And that's very, uh, that's, uh, very important. So I just wanted to list for you just uh, some of the innovations that took place. We created an options exchange, which is nothing more than value insurance. It's an instrument that you can buy that says, if you have this contract, you can sell the asset you own at a fixed price on or before a given date. It's just an insurance policy that says, you can always be assured of getting this price, whether it's a share of stock, a house, a bond, or whatever. So it was an insurance market that was created. The first ones, options have been around since you know, thousands of years, but in terms of an exchange, this was the first time. We similarly created financial futures markets for trading risks and everything from currencies that now we're running around, interest rates and stocks. We created the first electronic stock exchange. There are things like money market funds and a bunch of other innovation. TIA Craft, which is now called TIA, they just rebranded themselves. Those of you who are from academia may know who they are. They were an insurance company that was created uh, by Andrew Carnegie for professors for their retirement. Uh, very large, and our Paul Samuelson was on the trustees, and they were the first major institution to internationally diversify its stocks as a regular policy back in 1972. Those of you who have 401ks or 403bs or saving for retirement or just, you routinely, as US people, invest outside the US. It's very standard to have funds all around the world. It's taken for granted. That didn't exist prior to that time. All these stock and other kinds of investments were essentially domestic. And as you'll see in a little while, that's not a small event. OK, so they had that. We had ERISA. That's the modern pension system in the United States, was created in 1974. All the pension funds you see out there, the trillions of dollars and all that, all of that was created in the 1970s as well in response. You have May Day, which <laughs> uh, happened on May 1st, so it was May Day, uh, in which the cartel of the New York Stock Exchange was Finito, so you had what's called negotiated commissions. It used to be prior to that that if I bought 100 shares of IBM, I paid a commission. If you as an institution bought 100,000 shares of IBM, you paid 1,000 times the commission. Sounds bizarre. You couldn't even imagine that today. Systems wouldn't work today. Nothing you see in finance that you take for granted could be done because it's all become institutions. And you're talking about costs being brought down to levels that are very, very low. Okay. Well, if you didn't have this change, and it took something to get this change done, as it often does, you had the creation of a national mortgage market. Prior to that, mortgage finance came from your local thrift institution. And if you're in a growth area, everybody moving in, they all wanted mortgages. Where do you get the money for it? Well, that's interesting. Hope a lot of people are saving in the town. And what we did is essentially create it so that anywhere in the world can finance Mortgages for people in the US. So I can be in Holland or in Tokyo, and I can be funding US mortgages. Well, that wasn't possible part of this. And on top of that, that transformed the whole industry from a one-stop place where you had to depend on that one, sh one place in town if it had money and if it had the confidence and it had the willingness to sell to a highly competitive systems where you had people and entities specialized in things like processing mortgages, which has nothing to do with finance. It's a processing problem. And decompose and transform the industry. Now, this illustrates what I, one of the points I wanted to make by going back to the 70s. When you have a crisis, whether in the 1970s or in 2008, it's like a fire. And all you're cared about is survival. 
You'll deal with the rest later. And if you want a metaphor, imagine firemen arriving in a blazing fire. What did they do? Whatever they have to do, first to get people out, and secondly, to put out the fire. And that may mean ripping down walls and breaking windows and doing all kinds of destructive things, which turn out perhaps to be necessary to do it. Of course, after the fire is over, you look at the mess, and you kind of say, well, I wish we didn't have to do that. And then there are times when they really are lucky and they have figured out a way to put out the fire without knocking walls down and breaking things up. But once the fire is out, the job's done, that's it. Here, the solution to the 1970s trial, or not the, a big part of the solution, in all of this innovation that I've listed here, first, it wasn't something that was destructive, like the breaking down of walls that would then have to be fixed after the crisis was brought to bear. It wasn't even something that worked, but then had no value. All the things you see here on this list exist today, are in the mainstream today, 40 odd years later. And all of us, in all the generations in this room, have benefited from it. In fact, so much so we take it for granted. There never has been a time since the creation of the national mortgage market that there wasn't mortgage money. Yeah, sometimes the credit's tighter, the interest rates change, but there was always money. We take that for granted. We say, hey, we got to pay too much, or maybe we think we should get more than we should for our house, but it's always there. That was not true. So when you hear about, you know, especially the youngers of you, you know, you hear in the good old days when we understood things, and we were, they weren't good old days. I, that's one of the advantages of having lived through them. There were lots of bad things, like not being able to, no one could get a house financed. That seems to be a pretty fundamental problem. And there were many more. So don't always listen to the rhetoric of the survivors. <laughs> They're the only ones to tell the stories. The ones who didn't survive are not around to tell you about it. OK, so just keep that in, in mind. But all of this innovation is still working today. Furthermore, this was developed in the United States. In the subsequent years, Every country in the world, even just developing ones, not just developed countries, have instituted these same kinds of risk markets, futures markets, swap markets, option markets, and have brought most all of these technology into their system. And indeed, by the way, has made it possible to have a globally integrated system, even though individual city, uh, nation state systems are heterogeneous with different rules, different currencies, and everything else. So there's some evidence that not only does this stuff work a good, but others who didn't have to looked at it and said, well, that looks good to us, and adopted it. So these are facts that you can find in the world. And so I wanted to show you how sometimes crisis can breed a lot of good things in response. Not that I wish crisis on us, but rather that crisis does have that impact of getting a lot of things done. And as it happened during this time, the research in finance science exploded. Now, there's no question that the finance science had a big impact on finance practice and innovation. But it's equally true that the extraordinary innovation had a feedback effect on the science. That we were able to see things, do things, learn things, and get inspirations for things that we wouldn't have otherwise had. So again, it was turned out to be, I think, a pretty virtuous feedback uh, loop for that. OK, so this is taking you through. That's the lesson. Now I'm going to pump you. 20 years later, we'll eventually get to today and even talk a little bit about tomorrow before we're done, OK? But I think it might be fun to just take you through this. So I'm going to take you to the 1990s, and I'm going to leave the United States and go to Europe, to Germany, which had just reunified East and West Germany. And as you're probably aware, the economic status of the two halves of Germany were quite different. Western Germany was very industrialized, very well developed, uh, certainly uh, one of the economic powerhouses, as Germany is today, of uh, Western Europe. And East Germany was not. And when they reunited them, one of the things that wanted to happen as a nation is to kind of bring them together. So I'm going to tell you a story. It's a real story. It's, I mean, I, I know it, OK? I mean, firsthand, so I actually know it. Um, there was a city in what was then East Germany called Leipzig. And the city of Leipzig decided it wanted to expand the amount of electric power it had in the city so it could grow and develop. And it turned out that electric power was generated by natural gas there. So I'm just giving you facts. So they wanted to expand the amount of natural gas they could get. 
And remember who's managing this city. I mean, they don't suddenly, when you have reunification, throw all the people, the mayors and the city managers, out of the city just because they reunified. This isn't like, you know, you vote out all the Republicans or all the Democrats that replace them all. So the same kinds of people, often the same people, were still there who were there when it was East Germany. But under East Germany, what was the case? It was a command and control economy. There weren't any markets. There weren't any real financial markets. There were no, nobody used present value or any tools like that. It was, we need it, let's do it, or whatever we think we should do. And that's the culture that they had had since the end of World War II. Okay? The reason this is important, I'm trying to show you the practical elements of how you get innovation really done, not just hypothetically. And the elements of that were that if you're going to present them with a solution, you know, something to do, it can't be complex. It can't even be as relatively simple as we might give to a first-year finance class here, the students. No disrespect to the students. You're just starting out. Because they just wouldn't have been able to make the judgment. So that was part of the design criterion. It had to be really, really simple for them to understand and make a decision. So here was the situation as it stood at the time. The city was offered two options. One from the Russians was a consortium that said, we'll get you the gas, and the deal is we'll give you gas for 15 years at a fixed price. You understand? So they fixed the price. And for 15 years, we'll deliver so much at so many Deutschmarks per MCF. This is before the euro. OK? So the contract the Germans were offering, I mean, the Russians were offering were, say, say, X Deutschmarks per MCF of gas for the next 15 years fixed. Now, to physically deliver it, they had to build a pipeline. And the pipeline was going to cost $300 million. Now, I know in today's dollars, that doesn't seem that big for a pipeline. But that's actually pretty a lot of money, particularly to the city of Leipzig. And you know in that fixed price they have to pay for that pipeline, right? I mean, they're not doing this out of their good heart. And the other thing is that you also had the issue that you were doing a deal with the Russians. And you know, some things don't haven't changed. There's nothing about people, the individual people personally, but let's just say it's, it can be somewhat taxing at times, as you see some more modern versions in the case of uh, the last five years. OK, but that's the deal. The alternative was to take the gas from the West, from the North Sea and so forth. And that would require a much smaller pipeline, $50 million. Uh, and you didn't have perhaps the same political risk. Well, what was the problem? The problem was, first of all, that that market price for that gas fluctuated all the time. Right? I mean, it wasn't constant. Now, if you've, you're, the people of your city for the last generation have lived in a place where prices are fixed. There isn't a price system. This is what you pay every month, and that's what you paid every month, independently of anything. And now you're going to suddenly say to them, by the way, this month your bill is $30 or 30, you know, 30 Deutschmarks. Next month it's 52, next month 41. Does that sound like that's like a likely thing to have people doing? People don't like that here, even though we've lived in market economies and in, you know, so. so the problem with the Western solution was that you'd have enormous amount of price fluctuation. And the risks or things causing the price fluctuation were multifold. First, it was, of course, the price of natural gas. But what else? Natural gas, as with oil, the currencies of which that is denominated is not Deutschmarks. It's dollars. And now, the Deutschmark, of course, was not fixed to the dollar. So you had currency risks, you had natural gas risks, and so forth. So you can imagine the city managers scratching their heads and saying, which do we pick? This is like, which would you rather do, freeze to death or burn to death? And then, how about neither? Well, now, the truth is, at that time, a very well-known global bank got wind of this. And they were in the business, among other things. They had a group that did financial solutions called financial engineering is a common term. All right? And they said, hmm. Here's a problem. Can we come up with a better solution? And the answer is they did. And here, I'm going to tell you how it was presented to the city managers. So think of yourself the city managers, OK? And then I'll tell you how they did it. So first, I'll show you the outcome. So they go to the city managers. You're, the city, you're all city managers, but I'm going to look at you because you're right in front of me, OK? And I say to you, look, the Russians, well, I'm not going to talk about the politics or anything. but." They're offering you 
fixed rate gas, X Deutsche Marks per MVF for the next 15 years. You like that, huh? How do you like it if two years from now, the price of gas that anyone can buy anywhere else is X over two Deutschmarks, and you're still paying X? So think of it, I'm paying 30 Deutschmarks per MCF, and the rest of the world is paying 15. You are the city manager. How are you going to explain that to your, the population of Cambridge? I mean, Leipzig. Why are you paying twice as much for the gas that everybody else can buy the gas? That's the nature of a fixed contract. You're happy it's fixed, this is not going to vary, but you're not going to be so happy if you have to explain people why you're paying twice as much. Easy if you're paying half as much, then you can be a big heroine or hero. But when you're paying twice as much, so think about that for the political point, but I'll put that to the side. But I bet that was on her mind because she's the one who actually has to explain the people. And when they come storming into the city hall, uh, you're, she's the one who's going to have to face them and explain to them the complexities of hedging and why before the fact decisions have to be made. And after the fact, you wish you may not have made them, but that's the decision. But what's the deal I'm going to offer you? They are offering you X Deutschmarks per MCF. Here's what I offer you. First, don't take the Russian deal. Take the West. Get your gas from the West. So I'm telling you where to get the gas. But here's what we'll do for you. Just buy it in the market. So hook up, do number one. Whoops, I pushed that button. Luckily, I was informed in advance that there's a button that did that. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd be panicking that I washed out all my slides. OK? So just go buy your gas at any price, whatever the market price is. You pay the market price. Any time that market price is more than X Deutschmarks per MCF, any time it's more, we'll rebate the difference. You understand? So if you pay 1.5x, we'll give you back 0.5x. Any time it's below, enjoy it. So in simple terms, think about this. You're the city manager. Which would you have? Always pay x, and think of the political when it goes the wrong way. Or never pay more than x but otherwise pay the market price. So you're paying what everybody else in the world is, except when you get a better deal. What's your decision? Which one do you like better? Well, that was not by accident the way it was framed. Actually, you can laugh, but that, I mean, I think it's obvious. It was obvious to the, when you finally got it done. But like so many things in finance and in many other areas, making it really, really simple for the customer or the client often is very, very complex for the producer. In other words, to be able to offer this contract was a very complex and required a complex set of tools, analysis, skills, and, and so forth. So what was under the hood of this simple contract is, in fact, very complex. So if you ever hear, oh, we should go back to the simple days in finance when all we had was the stock market and bond market and so forth, the answer is that wouldn't have worked here. <laughs> you couldn't have done the solution. But I was first wanted to see what you're getting. It's like when you buy the car, you turn on the keys, and it goes, and you like it. But you don't have to know how an internal combustion engine works or all the stuff under the hood. But it's complex, and the engineering. Now, the first question you should have asked as the manager is, wait a minute. If it's too good to be true, it's probably not true. Or there is no free lunch. And how are you able to offer an obviously better deal than the Russians, where the Russians giving us a high value the price? Are they trying to? The answer is may, may have, but that's not what the Russians were doing. So then you might say, well, which of us is a better credit? Maybe, maybe you promised to do this for 15 years, but how do we know you'll do it? Just as the Russians have promised to pay you, give you gas for 15 years. How do you know they'll do it? Well, it turned out that this bank had a far better credit rating in Russia. It was a it was a AAA back when that meant something. A global bank, it was one of the most well-known banks in the world. And if you had to take the choice of which credit, you were actually better off taking that bank than taking Russia. Okay, so it wasn't a credit deal. Where did it come from? If you can't understand where you're getting the free lunch, it's probably not free. The answer is here. And I should go over here, is that because you're doing the Western thing physically, you're getting your gas in the West, what are you not doing? You're not building that pipeline from Russia. 
you're building a much smaller one. So instead of spending $300 million for a pipeline, you spend 50. That means there's 250 million real dollars, not phony dollars, not accounting dollars, not you know, shell game dollars, real dollars being saved. And that's the source of how the bank was able to offer a better deal to Leipzig. And at the same time, it's in business. It has to pay for its people, its risks, and everything else, and make a profit. So that's the answer to how the magic worked. We didn't have to build a $250 million more expensive pipeline. We built a smaller one. And it turned out roughly, and that's roughly, about half went to the city and half went to the bank. Not as profit to the bank, but risk paying people, et cetera. So Leipzig came out of this with $125 million more dollars, real dollars to spend, than it would have otherwise. And it got rid of a political risk at various levels, which is non-pecuniary, but you wouldn't like to have people, your neighbors coming in wanting to lynch you. OK? So that's what happened. Now, how did they do that? It was all done with contractual agreements, derivatives. Derivatives are contracts like options and futures and so that allow us to move risk around without moving money around. So there's no investment, there's no money, just move risks around. You know, you've heard of capital flows in and out of countries. That's money or cat. You've heard of trade flows. We also have risk flows. And if we can move the risks around, we can have real effects. It is not, as some people have said at one point, all they're doing is moving the deck chairs around on the Titanic. It's all going down anyway, because they're not getting rid of risk. That doesn't understand what's going on. Where you put the risk matters a lot. And if you've never thought about it, think of a life insurance policy. If any one of you had to insure anyone else's life, you would not do that for $1.50 per thousand. You would not insure someone's life for a million dollars for $1,500, I doubt. You understand you get $1,500, but if the person, unlikely, but if the person passes away, you pay a million. You can't do that. But with the risk sharing done properly, it's easy to do. So these are real effects. Remember, I started my remarks by pointing out that these are real. They have real effects on the economy. They have real effects on what we can do. And they have real effects on what people are willing to do. If you can share the risks and move them around properly, then you can undertake projects of every kind that would be too risky, imprudent to undertake if you had to do it yourself or if you didn't. But if you move the risks around to make it prudent, it works. My colleague Andrew Lowe has been giving stuff here at MIT on how to use finance to solve the case of cancer. Well, what it's really about is how do you share the risks of all the development in an efficient enough way that you get all the great ideas coming out of MIT uh, and other places on new molecules or ideas for cures, how do you get those actually looked at and studied and put into trials if they deserve it. And that's what it's about. It's all about moving the risks around. These are real effects. Okay. Now, the derivatives that they had back in the days in the 90s were very, very crude relative to today. There were no heating oil futures to hedge their risk. Remember, they're making a guarantee to the city of Leipzig for 15 years. That's a long time. They're guaranteeing that anything above that price they're going to pay back. They're guaranteeing it in Deutschmarks. And there were, everything was traded in dollars. So they were taking all kinds of risks, currency risks, pr uh, energy price risks, et cetera, et cetera. OK? They did the best they could with what they had, and they executed. Was it complicated? Absolutely complicated. Not just mathematically complicated, complicated towards experience, knowledge, being able to execute the transactions. Could you do it easier today? Absolutely. We have futures in, in natural gas. The, the contracts there only went out five years. Now they go out 10 and 15. So we have much, much richer markets today and knowledge than we had back in the 90s. So there are things where you can really do in the real world, in scale, that work that couldn't have been even contemplated then. This is 20 odd years ago. Okay. So I'm trying, if nothing else, you get across. You understand this is the world you are in, at least in my little patch of your world, which is called finance. All right? And that's how they pulled it off. Now, there's one more point to the story. You said, gosh, this guy is taking us. Oh, where did my watch go? I put it out, so I made sure I didn't talk beyond the time you're here. OK, we're going to be OK, I think. So 
Why did I take you back 20 years? Because, first of all, what was the benefit? The benefit was Leipzig ended up with $125 million that they could use for other projects. Pretty important to a city that was making an emergence from, you know, a pr pretty big one. But what else did it happen? And that's very modern. A pipeline was not built. A nasty pipeline, nasty to what? To the environment. All pipelines are that way. We do it because we have to or we're willing to. This was a pipeline that would have been built, a big one, all the way from Russia. And you can imagine all the stuff, because you were living today, it hasn't changed. In fact, it was probably worse then, because we were even less sensitive. It had less tools. But every time you build something like that, there's an environmental cost. This is green. And this is not the only example. I'll give you another quick one. The TVA, which is the electri uh, electricity cooperative in the United States created during the Great Depression, okay, put out contracts to all the mom and pop. It had to be only people connected to the grid, people actually generating electricity. But they're sort of little mom and pop. They're not mom and pops, but they're little places that generate relatively small amounts of electricity. But they're connected to the grid. They put out contracts. They were buying calls to buy electricity, and selling puts, guaranteeing the price of electricity to anyone who was connected to the grid. And they sold enough of this stuff to all of them that they didn't have to build two nuclear power plants. That's 35 conventional power plant equivalents. Why? Because they reorganized what was out there through a market, through these securities, which could not be done by some central brilliant committee who sat down and looked at all the grid and tried to figure it out. It can't be done. But these instruments allowed that to happen. So part of the story here, I'm trying to you know, reach the broadest of audiences here, is to see it not only saved money, it was more efficient in that sense, it was green. Because if you manage things well, if you manage risks well, you can be more efficient. You can avoid that. It's one of the ways to have sustainability work. And that's a very modern ideal, not just one of the 1990s or the 1970s. All right. So this list is some of the things that derivative contracts do. I know you've heard the big D word. Oh my god, there's, you have one of those. Actually, I should tell you, they've been around for half, well, they've been around since the time of the Bible, but, but in terms of large scale use since the 70s when I took it, that's when the explosion created and they've been adopted around the world. They are a central part of every financial system. No financial institution in the world, including all the central banks of the world, the Fed, okay, the Bank of England, ECB, can function without derivatives. Uh, this is not an advertisement for it, it's just telling you when you hear people say we ought to get rid of them or something or we don't need them. Uh, that's someone who has never actually been out in the world, at least this part of the world, because that's not feasible. And furthermore, it's, they're, they're benign. They're tools. They don't have a soul, no more than a corporation has a soul. They're tools we've designed to help us to do things. And like all tools, whether it's a chainsaw or anything else, of course, any tool can be, that's very good can be used very well or it can be misused. And of course, we have to be careful about that. So I'm not suggesting that there aren't issues that have been involved that you've heard about. But I'm just pointing out to you, you have to put it in perspective. The solution is, we can all agree, I think, in this room, in any field, not just finance. How about we agree that we want all the fools and knaves to be gotten rid of? We don't want fools and knaves making decisions for us or you know, getting paid by us. How many people oppose that? You do? You oppose it? Oh, oh! I was going to say, whew, I was going to say, hey, you're the first one. I, but you know, maybe you're, well, I won't mention his name. You're not PC, but maybe that's OK, OK? But in any case, um, my point is, we can all stipulate that. But don't ever get confused between a bad example of a good thing and something that's just not a good thing. Something's not a good thing we don't want. Something that's a good thing, but a bad example, we want to fix it back as an example, not get rid of the good thing. Just keep that in mind as a general th thought process when you're listening to people's prescriptions. And yes, in the middle of a crisis like the firemen, all you want to do is survive. Yes, sometimes you have to do a lot of tearing down. But understand that's what you're doing. And that a lot of things we had to do in this crisis were of that sort. We're going to have to rebuild. But that's OK. That'll, we do that pretty well. Um, so these are lists of some of the things. I'm not going to go through them with you given the time. 
But I wanted to move us a little forward to one example. You'll notice I've used examples because I've tried to use examples that are big, meaning big projects, big things, so you don't think this is some toy that somebody in some lab somewhere or someone found some example in some exotic place. These are mainstream things going on all the time. Uh, looking forward, I wanted to just give you an example of something else that you might find kind of interesting. And this is the notion of global diversification as pays. The term a free alpha is jargon. So if you don't know what that means, it's OK. Uh, but let me just tell you, there are three, only three ways of managing risk. You can diversify you know, by one tenth of 10 ships that you insure rather than insuring one ship 100%. Don't put all your eggs in the same basket. And you're unlikely to lose the whole thing. So that's diversification. It's a classic way of thing. And the benefits of diversification be gotten for free. You don't pay for diversification. You don't have to pay anything for it. Okay. The second way is hedging. That's simply saying, I have something risky. I sell it to him and invest in something safe. So I've, just, I've got rid of the good things, and I've got rid of the bad things. So it's a hedge is both ways. I've, I'm no longer exposed to the risk either way, good or bad. That's the second way. That's also free. The third way is insurance. Insurance is I keep this thing, I keep the upside, but someone else pays me if I have the downside. I like that, but guess what? That isn't free. Somebody has to take the downside, and they have to be paid for that, just like when you insure your car, your house, or your life. If they would give it to you for free, I'd love that. I'd buy a lot of it myself. I don't know about you. But unfortunately, you have to pay for it. So the three ways, all risk is managed by some combination of these three. And insurance is the only one you pay for. Now, if you don't diversify, or you don't diversify as well as you could is feasible for you, then you have given up a benefit, which I can quantify for you here. That's the point. You've given up a benefit which you had for free. Because diversification doesn't quite. So here's something that's available for free. If you don't do it, you've lost out on it. Now, let me illustrate that in a context that I've been in Asia, but I've been all around the world on these things. So let me just use China, which is not bad. It's either the first or second largest economy, depending on who you talk to or how numbers that you measure. But it really doesn't make any difference whether it's number one or number two. It's big and important. It's important for itself. It's important for Asia. And it's important for the world because China, if it does what it's likely to want to do and should probably do, is not more than just a big country. It's going to be, in the, at least in the economic world as well, it's going to be a, a superpower or a super energy. So it has great impact and responsibility. Now, you're looking at this graph, you say, what in the hell is this? All right, let me tell you to say simply. I looked at the question of if the best diverse, first let me tell you what the best diversification is, because I tell you the ideal diversification, that's your standard, right? That's your, your North Star, your Nirvana. And the closer you get to that, the better you are in terms of diversification, not everything. This is one dimension. The best diversified portfolio at the current time is the world portfolio. That means you hold every asset in the world in proportion to the amount outstanding. There are theories to explain that, but the common sense is you hold everything out there in the world. That's the best diversification, at least until we go to Mars, then we can extend. But right now, we're just pretty much on Earth. So that is the gold standard of diversification. So now we know what the gold standard is. It isn't really feasible. But we can approximate, and that's done, OK? So I've used this as an approximation. MSCI is a particular company. It's no, by the way, I have nothing to do with MSCI. I do with other companies, but not them. So this is not a disguise. There's no conflict of interest, or I'm not trying to sell you anything, at least anything commercial. Uh, I see, obviously, ideas. And I looked at the world portfolio, and that was a proxy for the best diversified portfolio. Do you understand? This is pretty standard. And I happened to pick the period, and my, uh, the lady who almost was the one person off in the room here who put her hand up, um, and she, she uh, uh, helped me get all this done. And we just picked 1993 because the data happened to be on the table. So there's nothing special about 1993, because I'm not trying to literally use the numbers to prove anything. I'm trying to illustrate like an example, but with real numbers. So we just had 93. But I wanted to take it through the end of 2015 to bring it up to date. 
So I just don't want you to say anything special about 1993. It just happened to be what was on the table. This is 24 years or whatever, OK? So we looked at data, and we asked ourselves, if we invested in the Chinese stock market for that period, we would have earned a return, an average return of some amount. All of these are measured in the same currency dollars, so you're, you're OK? We would have earned so many, you know, a rate of return, just like you do in a bank account or the US stock market. There would have been an amount of risk or volatility around that average, which is a measure of the risk of the portfolio. Does that make sense to you, even if you're not in finance, right? How volatile it is, up and down, round, maybe way down, way up, OK? And we've seen a lot of both of those, OK? So does everybody stand? So there's some notion of risk that we had during the period, and there's some notion of the average return. The average return is on the uh, uh, ordinate, and the risk is on the abscissa. And as you have been told, I'm sure, there's no free lunch. So in general, to get higher expected returns, not realized returns, you got to take more risk. So that shouldn't surprise you. If you want to go higher up, you typically have to go out to more risk. There are no free lunch. OK? Everybody get the pictures and what this got. What are these pictures? Well, that point up there is actually what the world portfolio did. It earned about, uh, you know, let's call it a little bit close to 9%. And it had 15 units of risk, 15% standard deviation. Don't matter. Just think of it as a risk unit. So you took 15 units of risk, and you ex post ended up with 9 return. OK? Now, here's what actually happened to China during the same period. OK? China was much riskier. Here's the risk of the world around 15. China had a risk of about 35. And that was its average return, which is about 9 also, maybe a little less. We have the numbers, but it's not the point. But you had to take a much more risk in China to get the same average return after the fact. Now, we all know we don't know what's going to happen. This is what happened. But it's very unlikely anybody forecasted, actually. Well, there's 7 billion people in the planet. We might find somebody. But the typical forecast would not necessarily be what happened. Typically, what we forecast isn't what happens. We have an ex ante before the fact. We have a probability distribution, and we have the outcome. You buy a lottery ticket, and you have some expectation, and you either win or lose. And if you lose, then that wasn't what you expected, or, you, or that isn't what you were hoping to get. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done it. And if you win, it's such a high return, uh, you, know, you know it couldn't have been expected, OK? So you understand the difference. So we do a correction for that. And I don't want to go through the technical things. We ask the question, given what happened to the world, conditional on what happened to the world in these 24 years, what would we have forecast China would have done not knowing what China di actually did? Do you see the experiment? I didn't show you China. I showed you world. And I said, Given what happened to the world portfolio, what would you your forecast conditional on that of what China would do? That's not what an investor knew back then, because we know what the world did. Does everybody understand the experiment? I tell you the world, what do you think China did? The beauty of that forecast is that it is an unbiased estimate of China, conditional on that. That is to say, what actually happened to China was, you know, maybe bad luck. In fact, we can say it, pro it was bad luck in the sense that China turned out to perform less well than it we expected it to do, given what the rest of the world did. So the point here that says China expected the green, that point, that's what we thought China would do if China had behaved neither bad luck or good luck, conditional on what world did. And we're just going to take what world did as what it did, because we're comparing the two. Does everybody understand the experiment? Because if you get it. Now, remember I mentioned hedging is a way of running risk? If I have a risky security of any type, and I have a risk-free security, that's once a sure thing. If I can mix those any way I want, I can put half in my money in one, half in the other, three quarters, right? That's my choice. Obviously, the more I put in the safe thing, the less risk I'm taking. But if the safe thing, as it does, has a lower expected return, I'm getting less risk. These straight lines that you see up there are the menu. They are the menu of expected returns you could have gotten for how much risk you were willing to take by investing in that particular risky asset and either the risk-free asset. Does everybody understand why? I'm just telling you that menu is a straight line. So that's like you're in the restaurant. 
You see three menus there. Remember what one is, this is expected return. We all like that. That's risk. We all don't like that. So let me ask you, look at, take any level of risk like here. Go straight up. If you did it in China, actually, that's the return you got. If you did it in China and China behaved as it should have or expected, you would have gotten that. But if you put it in the world, you got that. Which one do you like? Blue, green, or red? Red. red. Yeah, OK, now you got it. And now you can pick any point. So you see, I didn't have to know what your aversion to risk. If you're very low risk per taking, you're down here. If you're a big risk taker, like investing, take the whole risk of China, you're up there. By the way, this line extends all the way up to here. You can go beyond the line. All these lines can be extended. So I can get any point on the menu right up to the ceiling. OK, that's really feasible, not a hypothetical. All right, does everybody understand? So if you actually had China, this is what you got. If you bought China beforehand and China behaved as you thought it would, you've gotten this. But if you had done world for the same risk, you'd be up here. You get the message? So what does it cost you not to have diversified? Or put it differently, if you are constrained either by psychology, what's called home bias, I only invest what I know about, and I, only, I live in China, and the only thing I know about is China, the rest of the world, who knows what they're doing, OK? So if I restrict myself to China behaviorally, or as is reality, if you're in China right now, you cannot invest all around the world without limitations. You can get some, but it's limited. At times, it's been prohibited. So it's not your choice, it's what you can do. You're not allowed to go to this restaurant. You've got to go to the green restaurant or the blue one. So we, each Seattle or one of it is, you can measure costs now of not having taken the free, it's called free alpha. Alpha is a measure of how much better you get for free, and that's what's there. And what we see here is that if we look at China, even along there, it underperformed even what we expected it to do by over 3% a year. Now, to put that in context, if you take the retirement system of China, which is just being transformed to a great big fund called NCSSF from the provinces, if you take that, the difference between X 3% a year, in 24 years, you'll have twice as much money for the whole retirement system. OK? I just want to scale it for you, for 1.5 billion people. So 3% a year is a very big number. It's very expensive to give that up for a society or for a pension system or for a retirement system or for any system. So the first thing these numbers do is indicate to people how expensive is it to just be in China, to restrict it just China only. Now, China's a big country, I mean, and it's growing, right? So, and this wasn't a bad period in our, in our heads, and yet the numbers are, you gave up 300, 3%, 3 300 basis points. That's pretty inefficient since you can get that for free. You don't have to pay for it. People spend hundreds of millions, actually billions of dollars out there in the financial sector to find smart people who can help them get a higher return for the same risk. You know, all these people you hear about that are multi-billionaires and so forth. They are people that were earned that money or got that money because they found ways on huge scale to be able to provide an extra 1% or 2%. Because when you apply that to trillions, that's worth unbelievable amounts. OK? Now, they do all this work and spend all this money, and then they do something they could do for free and don't do it. That's almost a sin, right? So I'm trying to show you something really simple, very basic, no complex, fancy thing. But I wanted to quantify it for you, for the world. Now, let me show you one other thing as we're getting here. So do you understand the, the story? The story is, if we were talking to China, and we said, you know, you, I'm not going to tell you where you should do this or not. Do you know how much this is costing the country? Your institutions, if they can't do it. Now, many Chinese institutions are permitted to invest overseas, but individuals, for the most part, are not. And their pension system is not clear, OK? And the first thing to say is that you understand what it's costing you. Not to say you shouldn't do it, but do you understand this is something that's costing you this amount? Do you really want to pay the price? You know, you might look at a Bentley car parked down in the garage and say, that'd be a car. 
Then I show you the price. You say, well, maybe I'll stick with a Camry. Because 30,000 is a lot less than 300. But if they were all 30, I think most of us would probably pick the Bentley. OK? So understanding what something costs is not independent of the decision to do it. <laughs> and so part of this is just to make clear to people in a very objective way, they say using the data and standard analyses, to show them uh, this is what it costs. But you can do better than that. This is MIT. Because a lot of times, the government will come back and say, yeah, we're sorry. It's a big cost. We agree. And we didn't want to impose this cost on the Chinese people or ourselves. But you know, we had other policies we wanted to follow. We wanted to protect against capital outflows. And if we open our borders up to what money going in and out, we got to worry about that. And other things I won't go into because we don't have time. Perfectly legitimate policy issues. And I'm not going to opine on them because Let's just say they're legitimate enough. Someone could credibly say, that's too important. We're willing to give up 3% a year. Guess what? Use financial engineering, and we can get rid of the 3% we're giving up and keep the policies. That's like getting a drug. You've seen them on TV, right? The drugs where they show people bouncing along after getting their drug, feeling wonderful. And the overvoice says, of course, your liver may be shredded by this. You'll get a heart attack. And don't take this if you're pregnant or thinking about being pregnant or if you have this or that and the other. Why? Because these are all side effects of this drug. That's a polite word. They make you sick. Okay, But we put up with it. Why? Because we get cured of something, or at least treatment for something, that's even worse. It's just so is usually the argument. Well, if it costs the country 3% a year, so be it. We've opposed, the policy is more important. If you could find a way of offering the drug without the side effects, with the same efficacy, I think that most people would prefer that. I don't think anybody wants to think about their liver being at risk and so forth, or worry about if they happen to be pregnant taking it. And that's what we can do, and it's done. And I probably don't have time. I'm probably running late. Yeah, I can see I am, um, as usual. So I can't quite go through this, because I have one more thing. But let's take this way. There is a way, and we've done it, and it's done. So this is all market proof. Everything I've talked to you about is market proof and technologies we've already done. So this is not some dream from a finance professor over in his office or his lab. Maybe by 2040, we can do this. Everything here can be done with market-proven technologies that are well understood, used, in fact, used all the time. But it is a very simple way, a non-invasive way, to eliminate this bad side effect and maintain those policies that take care of things like capital controls and so forth. No problem. So you'll just have to take my word for that or come back sometime or sign up for my class uh, to find out more. But just to finish, let me show you one other country in Asia, Korea. Korea, as you can see here, the blue line, which is what actually happened to Korea, is higher than the green line, which is what we expected to happen. So unlike China, which after the fact underperformed what we expect it would have done, given what world did, Korea outperformed what we expected it to do, given what happened to world. Do you understand how to read the lines? That's why the blue is above the green here. Unlike the previous one, you see the blue is below green for China. The blue is above green for, China, uh, for Korea. Korea outperformed. Now, in 1993, nobody had this information. Nobody. But imagine I could have given you in 1993 the following piece of information. For sure, not an estimate, for sure, Korea is going to be a better performing country than anyone expected. Outperform. It's an outperforming country after the fact. I'm giving you a piece of the future, a very valuable piece of the future. I'm telling you it's going to outperform by quite a bit. And I'm telling you that for sure. You get the experiment, even though we couldn't have done it. There's nobody on the planet that had that information, for sure. But I'm going to give it to you. Can you get a sense of how valuable this is? And by the way, this is for a whole country. So the scale of which you could take advantage of this is not one little investment in some little rinky-dink, you know, excuse me, some little startup firm somewhere. You're talking about you've got a whole base of a country. I've told you the whole country is going to outperform over the next 24 years. That's an incredibly important piece of information. What might you have done with that if I gave it to you? And you really knew I gave it to you. I mean, you knew it was true. You'd say, well, what am I going to invest in? Korea, right? Why would I invest in anything else? I know for sure it's going to outperform 
It's expectation. Well, how would you have done? The blue line, remember, is actual. You did do better than expected, but let's look at right here. So if you took this amount of risk, you expected to get that return from Korea. You actually got that. So you see how it outperformed? But do you see what? It did worse than my two sisters who are brilliant and lovely people who couldn't care less about finance, and all they did was put their money in a Vanguard World Portfolio or MSCI World Portfolio, knew nothing about finance, and surely didn't know that Korea was going to outperform uh, its, its expectation for the next 24 years. And my sisters cleaned the clock of you with that information, which is incredibly valuable information, I assure you, if you could ever get it. What happened? You screwed up on the easy part. The hard part was getting the information about Korea. I gave it to you. What did you do? You made the mistake of using the information in the wrong way. You put it all in Korea. You forgot about diversification. What you should do is take the information and optimally miss it with the rest of things to get diversification. Then you would really have done better than my sisters. But if you didn't do that simple thing that I can teach in the class, that anybody can do, it doesn't take something that I can't teach in my class. And that's a crime. So I'm going to have to quit on this because you know it's easy for me to stand up here, hard for you to sit there, especially for length of time. But what's the overall message that I want to give you here? One, I want you to understand a little bit about finance. Understand that almost all of what finance is about is managing risk, not forecasting what's going to happen. That's for macroeconomists. Finance is all about putting the risks in the right place. If we didn't have uncertainty or if it was not very important, we would have an incredibly simple financial system. We'd have one kind of security, treasury bills. Every security would earn the same return. We didn't, we, there would be no insurance. Why? Right? Because we know the future. We don't need insurance. OK? As an approximation, of course. It's not even close to approximation. The world is an incredibly risky place and complex. And managing, and, managing that risk and placing it in the right places has, I hope you'll come from this had really big, real effects. If you manage risk better, it's not just being safer. It means that you can make prudent risks that weren't prudent. If I can manage the risk better, then we can do things which have benefits that would not have been prudent otherwise. So don't think of looking after risk as very important, but it's a safety thing. It's for growth, because we can take on projects with high expected growth rates if we can manage the risks right. Just as, as my colleague Andrew Logue shows, that if you are going to do one molecule where the expected return, you know, you have a if cancer drug just going into the first phase, maybe a 5% chance of getting commercial success, 19 out of 20 failures. If you look at the pricing of the cost of growing a drug, the expected return on that is about 12%. Expected. The risk, if you do one molecule, don't diversify, is 430%. Nobody is going to take a 430% risk for the compensation of a 12%. But if you use diversification, you can turn that 420 into 34. So drugs, growth development, all of these things can't be done. It's my first opening remark. The financial system is critical to getting the technology and things implemented, therefore actually having an effect on growth. You have to actually do it. To do it, You've got to manage, you have to get the resources, but it's not just enough of putting savers together with investors. That would be the, all we need if we had a world of certainty. We are not in a world of certainty in that case you haven't noticed it, okay? That big little thing, or little big thing, is the difference between all of what you see in the structures around the world, the financial systems, and not. That's how you get things done. That's how you get growth done. And that's why countries that have well-developed financial systems grow better and are ones to succeed more in a material way, not just an add-on way. Thank you very much for your time. I appreciate your coming. And let's all celebrate 100 years in Cambridge. <laughs>